We're going to be in Acts today, and then we're going to be in Genesis chapter 37, but we're going to be in Acts chapter 7 to start out. I had a neighbor, he ended up being a professor at Iowa in art, and he would make ceramics, uh, pottery in his backyard. He had a wheel, you know, he'd take the clay and he'd mold it and he'd make it. I thought it was so neat. I read this week about a guy who was a ceramics expert and a psychologist wanted to start a business, so they started one, and they called it Psycho Ceramics. <laughs> Someone said, what do you do? We study crap pots. <laughs> crack pot psychologist, anyway. It's bad, but I, I, I also heard another goofy joke. I'll tell you this one, too, while you're looking up Acts chapter seven, this truck driver, uh, you know, he got a job, and they interviewed him, and they were asking him what he'd do in certain situations. They said, now, if you're going down a big hill, and there's traffic at the bottom of the hill, and your brakes go out, what do you do? And he said, well, I'll look to see if I can get off to the right. Well, what if there's a, a, a cliff there? Well, then I'll look to the left. What if there's a cliff there? He said, then I'll wake up Leroy. And the guy said, what do you mean, wake up Leroy? Well, he's my buddy. Why, what, what's he got to do with this? He said, well, he's never seen a wreck like this before. <laughs> so, that's bad. <laughs> Acts is a great transitional book, as you know. It connects, you know, the synagogue and the church and the epistles and the gospels. And we see the apostles still working miracles. The church is being established. They're still going to synagogue and all that. And Luke here is writing during a time of persecution by Nero. Persecution like there's never been for Christians. But then you throw into that the fact that there's religious persecution. The Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, and Pharisees hate Christians. And so you've got this extreme uh, situation going on. And he writes this book. And I love about, about Acts. It's a great book because it goes to the Old Testament and brings the Testaments together as well. And so today we're looking at the story of Joseph. My favorite story in the Bible is this story right here. And I'm going to try and tell this story uh, this morning in my 35 minutes that I normally take. And maybe it may be a two-parter. I don't know what God has. But uh, archaeologists have confirmed so much about this story. I know that um, Walter, uh, Sir Walter Woolley excavated a place in Syria, and he found a statue of a king which born inscription recorded in the second millennium before Christ. And on that statue, it had a story inscribed about a man uh, who had envious brothers, lived in a desert, uh, becoming famous by interpreting dreams, his brothers being envious of him, how, he, how they didn't recognize him later, he forgave him and rewarded him. It's all in an inscription several thousand years old. Then also, there's a depiction by an artist about 1,300 years before Christ of a man giving a gold chain, an Egyptian giving a gold chain to somebody, giving them authority. Again, remi reminding us uh, of the fact archaeology always supports the Bible. And then there's another discovery uh, about a message from a pharaoh regarding a seven-year famine. And we have all this in this great story of Joseph. And so let's stand and read a few verses here as we have a custom of standing. Chapter 7, verse 8, and then we're going to jump over to chapter 37 of uh, Genesis. But Acts 7, 8, and he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. Now that's something you want to mark in your Bible. Circumcised him the eighth day. Why, why would I mark that, Pastor? That's a great thing for apologetics because this was written, Genesis was written 1,500 years before Christ. We don't even know if Luke, the physician, even understood the importance of vitamin K being established in the human body on the eighth day. That's why they circumcised baby on the eighth day, because they had blood clotting ability. So mark that. But anyway, you say, shut up and read, Pastor. I will. Thank you. And it says, circumcised him the eighth day, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the 12 patriarchs. And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. Love that. And delivered him out of all of his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now there came a dearth, a famine, over the land of Egypt and Canaan and great affliction, and our fathers found no substance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. 
And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him, and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers. Bless us, God, as we take a look in the book, your book, for a walk in this world. The prince and power of the air of this world is Satan, and he's having a time. But you're going to come one day and straighten this mess out. Lord, as we walk through this life, we just ask you to help us and guide us from your word. Bless now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. Go back over to Genesis chapter 37. I have put my notes, a stack of them in the back because people ask before. I mean, you know, Mike needs them and Bryce uses them for Sunday nights and so forth. So if you want a copy of these notes, they're in back because I often go so fast. First of all, we find Joseph in the patriarch's place. And we know there he was really favored, wasn't he? He had a, a special coat of many colors. He was in Prince's Raymond, and he lived a life of security and favoritism and all those things we find in his life. And uh, we know it was really good while he was preferred by his father over his brethren. But that's not good parenting, is it? Because we know that when a father favors one, giving him special treatment, uh, over others. Kids see that. They respond to that. And so he has 11 jealous, or 10 for sure, jealous or envious brothers. So back to chapter 37 now. We notice here that his brethren hate him. 37 verse 4. And I'll go rather quickly. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him. They hated him. Well, what does the New Testament equate hate to? Murder. Some of them wanted to kill him. Verse 5, it says, the last line, they hated him yet the more. Uh, verse 8, it says here, and they hated him, the last line, yet the more for his dreams and for his words because he would tell them the dreams he was having and some of the dreams involved them bowing to him. And that would be fulfilled when he was in Egypt, right? And so all this stuff we find uh, making them more and more envious. Verse 11, and his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. And, uh, of course, we know um, his brethren were, were just filled with rage and anger. And they envied him so much. And I, I think about how, how much they hated him that they would hurt him to the extent that they would hurt him. But I think about the story, and it's interesting to me, and this is something new that I, I, I mentioned to a ladies' class a year or so ago, and this kind of hit me this week in my studies. Even though I've preached through Acts, I've got to still spend a lot of time, uh, you know, because there's always fresh and new stuff. And I was thinking about how that God's plan was for Jacob to marry Leah. And, of course, for God to have that plan work, he would use Laban's deceptiveness <laughs> to get him to force Leah on him. Her face was covered completely except for her eyes and uh, in the darkness of night and all. He married her and, and what an interesting story as he really saw Rachel. Ooh, she was a looker. But Rachel was a shopper and she put a lot of makeup on, spent a lot of time in front of the mirror and at malls and so forth. God had Leah as a plan. And when you look at the fact that both Reuben and Judah were the ones that said, don't kill him, spare him. And Judah is in the line of Jesus Christ. So Leah is the line of Jesus, not Rachel. It's Jacob and Leah and Judah. And who's the line of the tribe of Judah? Jesus Christ. And in this, in chapter 47, I'm jumping ahead uh, to a chapter. I want to just read you chapter 44, verse 33. And we'll come back to 37. Hold your horses there, bubs. But it says here, Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servants abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord. Here is Judah saying, Keep me, do not harm uh, Benjamin. Take me in his place. What's that a type of? Who went to the cross in my place? Judah. Judah's offspring, Jesus. Here Judah is saying, Take me. Take me. I love that. But back in chapter 37, he, here we have Joseph has a dream. He tells his brethren, and the brothers get mad about it. And, of course, they already hate him, the envy him. And chapter 37, verse 18 says, And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. So they're saying, let's kill him. Let's get rid of him. We don't want him in our life. And they begin to plot. In verse 20, 
Come now, therefore, and let us slay him. And they talk about it. But, of course, we already said it was Reuben and Judah that said, no, don't kill him. Later, when Judah and Reuben are gone, they sell him. Throw him in the pit. Take his coat. You know the story. Cover it in blood so it can go back to dad and make dad think he's dead. And they've, they're going to do all this evil unto Joseph. Verses 36 to 28, the merchants are going to profit. They're going to they're buy him and sell him. But in chapter 45, we find the providence of God in sparing him. When Joseph says to his brethren, it wasn't you that sent me here, it was God. It wasn't you that did this to me, it was God. I wonder what kind of a Christian you are in your walk with God. Can you get to the place in your life when you can accept God's sovereignty in your circumstances? Or do you still blame people for your problems? Do you say, well, I don't like that guy, he did this. When are you going to mature to the point where you can accept that? Here's Joseph who accepts God's plan for his life, which at the time included being denied and rejected by his own 11 or 10 brothers, thrown into a pit, sold as a slave, ends up in, in Potiphar's house, and God again exalts him and blesses him. Again, the enemy comes in, and his wife accuses him. You know the story. He ends up now in prison. And yet, when he matured into what he should become, what did he say? This is all God's thing. It's a God thing. It's a God thing. Read a story about a young lady who's raped, contemplating heaven, an abortion ends up giving life, and her child becomes a great Christian man. Isn't that something? To be able to do that, to mature to the point in your life where you can do things because you care. And I love that Joseph offers an olive branch to his brethren in the end and says, hey, I want a relationship with you. I talk a lot about forgiveness. When I was here for two and a half years before, I talked about reconciliation like every Sunday. <laughs> and I just talked about you people need to learn to forgive. And they, some of them just wouldn't. And, and to the day of their death, they never did. Forgiveness comes in two parts. We, we learn in counseling that we need as believers to make the decision to forgive. Decisional forgiveness is vitally important. That's when you say, you know, I, I know this person wronged me, hurt me, whatever, but I know God will never bless me because God says if I don't forgive, he's not going to forgive me. So we choose to forgive, but it doesn't end there, does it? Because emotional forgiveness may go on for a long time beyond, where we get beyond the hurt of being hurt. That can take time, years sometimes. But if you make the decision for, to forgive, God can heal your soul and your emotions and get you through that time in your life. Some of you maybe have been done wrong, and I know some, some have had dis, difficult situations at work, in neighborhoods, and, and, and people have done you, some of your family's done you dirty. I understand that. But you have to find grace to be like Jesus Christ in choosing to forgive. The emotional part, it'll be a while. You may have some baggage, but you're going to have to make the decision to forgive. Let me tell you, signs, if you're not forgiving, if you're still talking about it now, you haven't forgiven. If you're avoiding them, you haven't forgiven. Here's Joseph. Talk about being done dirty. You, you can't compare sibling rivalries to this. His own brothers threw him in a pit and sold him as a slave. They wanted to kill him. That's Cain and Abel stuff, right? And so you can forgive people who've harmed you. You can choose to forgive. And in time, God can give you the grace to forgive and help you with your emotions. Honestly, there's situations in my life where I have to all the time pray, give me, God, give me the grace. There's two people in my life that have hurt me in, in, in years past, deeply hurt me. There's one story I could tell you. You'd say, I don't know how you recovered from it. There's only one way you recover. The grace of God. How do you think God feels when we do him dirty? Do you know when you love the things of this world, you're cheating on God. You know, all of us commit 
spiritual adultery by loving the world and spending time in the world. It can be simply fishing. It can be simply a video game. Or even loving a child more than you're supposed to. Your love for God is supposed to be huge in comparison to your love for your own children. Now, we love our own children. We love our own selves. But God's been done dirty over and over, and yet he uses grace towards us. So now we find Joseph in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's a chamberlain, an officer of the king. It's translated chamberlain. In one place, it's translated eunuch. One writer said that's why his wife was chasing jo Joseph, because he was a eunuch. Well, we don't know that, because the word, the Hebrew word, can mean several things. It can mean eunuch. It can mean chamberlain. It's translated so many ways in your Bible. Uh, it, it, it can include the idea of castration is, is one way it can, can be translated. But he was an officer in the king's court, and he had a wife. And you would think, being an officer in the court, he would have had to pick of the litter, so to speak, even though women aren't dogs, okay? But he would have been able to choose a wife to his liking. And like, like Jacob was looking for a looker, you know, he, he got a looker. But here he is, and, and he is, uh, you know, uh, an officer of the king. And what happens here? Well, we find that uh, in verse chapter 39, turn over a couple pages, we find the persistence of a woman. Verse 7, normally when a woman, excuse me, is persistent and wants a man, it's really hard for a man to say no, because we're weaklings, aren't we, in that area. Chapter 39, verse 7, and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, lie with me. Boy, that's pretty much to the point. Sleep with me. She's persistent. Look at verse 10. Verse, uh, verse 10. And it came to pass as she spoke to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. Day by day. Then look at verse 12. And she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. The Bible says flee fornication. He literally ran away. Now, why did he run away? Why did he run away? Strong Christian man like this. Because he knew if he stayed, he'd have failed. He had to run. Some of you think, well, you know, I really uh, am tempted to do certain things. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to make a fool of myself. Joseph didn't care about making a fool of himself. He, he took off, left his outer garment. She grabbed a hold of it. He left it behind and he bolted out of there. Why? Because he loved the Lord more than her, more than sin. If he stayed, he'd have played. If he played, he'd have paid, because we reap what we sow. And I, I know that there's been times I've talked about morals, and I've had actually men get agitated because I tell your wives the truth about what you really are. <laughs> you know, we are all this close to being a moral delinquent. Men are morally struggling day by day. You don't want your wives to know that, but it is true. See how quiet it is? No men are saying amen. <laughs> Ladies, you can say amen. Men are so weak in that area. And here's Joseph. He knew if he stayed, he'd have played. So he ran. He ran. I love that. Flee fornication. The word fornication is a general word. The Greek word is the word pornia. And a lot of sins fall under that. Adultery falls under that umbrella. Beastliality. Yes, men and animals. Uh, pornography. Did you know, man, if you're looking at porn, you're cheating on your wife? Hey, it's not okay to look. We all notice a pretty gal, but we have to look away. Because if you continue to look, you're going to think the thought. And thinking the thoughts causes you to want to act upon that. And, and that's why wives should never deny their husband his benevolence offering. That's what Corinthians calls it. It's a little three-letter word we say sex. Now, they hear it in school. 
Everyone in here is supposed to be 12 or older, so they hear it at school. It's not a bad word. It's a wonderful thing in marriage. But if a wife denies her husband, he's struggling. Let me tell you, I'm not excusing men. The men who say, well, my wife wouldn't take care of me and I found someone else. No excuse. No excuse. Immorality is immorality. And it's a serious sin. And the consequences are very, very bad. Very harmful to your marriage, to your kids. And I'll tell you one thing. I think about my four boys and my daughter. Do I want to go out and do something like that? David said, I can hurt several generations. He said in Psalm 73, I want to give up. But I think about all the generations I would hurt. What about my grandkids? It's not just my kids. It's another generation coming along that loves their papa. And they know their papa is a pastor and a Christian, and he always talks to them about the Bible. I have two of my grandsons. I want to get them in the Word, so I've already asked them. You know, I hadn't asked them. I already planned this. I'm going to ask them to read a certain section of their Bible at Thanksgiving weekend because I remember what those two passages did to me as a young Christian man. I want them to know God, and, and one of them's already trusted God. I want them to know all about God and to grow closer to God. And if I go out and throw my life away and ruin my life, what am I going to do to them? What am I going to do to my children? Think about others when you're going to sin. Selfish people satisfy themselves because they're selfish people. And selfish people only care about me, myself, and I. Their own personal trinity. Listen, you need to think about the consequences. And, you know... 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says that God always gives us an escape if we, if we need it. If we want an escape, there's always a way out, isn't there, of temptation? I think it's on the screen. Did you put, oh, we have, never mind, I'm sorry, it's all right. I thought Zane was back there. But, yes, there it is, thank you, Kenneth. There's always a way to escape. The problem is, sometimes we just don't want to escape temptation. Sin feels good. Sin is fun. You can enjoy sin and just have a good time in sin. Look at the world. They're having a good time in sin. The problem is you forget about consequences. There's consequences for every sin we commit. And when you go out and throw it away morally, and I mean you young people, you're going to battle. Boy, you're going to battle. When I get to heaven, I say, God, why? At 13, was I already a man and couldn't marry till I was 23? And it's tough to be a young person, and your hormones are raging, and we all know that because we were there. But you better be careful. Because you reap what you sow. I meet people all the time that say, I... Messed up as a young person. Why does Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, write a whole chapter on remembering your creator when you're young and healthy and can live for him? Because he knows the mistakes he made. So now Joseph here flees and she falsely accuses him. He ends up in this dungeon. And um, here he is in a pit in a dungeon. And, and yet God blesses him while he's there. The, the Bible says, now we're going back to chapter, I'm just going to go back to chapter 7 of Acts for a moment and read a verse here, and then we'll come back to Genesis. So stay where you are in Genesis, and I'll go here in Acts chapter 7. I want to read verse 10. It says here, And he delivered him out of all his affl- of his afflictions and gave him favor. That's also translated grace in your Bible, isn't it? It's the word charis, our word charity comes from that. God gave him favor. And wisdom... Wisdom, the the beginning of wisdom is fear of God. And God gave him this when he's in prison and promoted him from prison into the palace. That's what God can do. When you honor God, he will honor you. Joseph honored God. It would have been fun to have a moral exchange with that woman. But he honored God. I love that about Joseph, one of my favorite Bible characters. And God gave him wisdom and and gave him favor. And he ends up in the palace. 
Now we're back at chapter 41 of Genesis, and we find him promoted. He's promoted in the palace. God gives him the ability to interpret dreams, and so he's rising in the ranks. Remember, he, he, he shared with a baker and butler their, their future, and, and one of them was killed, and the one who should have remembered him forgot all about him. And then finally, when Pharaoh had a bad dream, he said, oh, there was a guy in prison. Well, get that guy. God utilized that to get him promoted. And boy, the Pharaoh said, man, this guy has some sort of wisdom. He just keeps nailing it. He knows what my dreams are. And not only what I dream, uh, but he can interpret them. And I mean, he's just totally blown away by Joseph. And his position here is in the kingdom. He rises in position. 4140, thou shalt be over my house and according unto my word. Uh, shall all my people be ruled only in the throne? Will I give a greater than? Will I be greater than thou? You're second in all of Egypt, and he's a Jew. Wow. God promotes him. Why? Because he lived right. Promotion always comes from the Lord. And I love chapter forty-five. You know what? Let's first read chapter forty-two. I'm going to read some verses. Forty-two, nineteen to twenty-one. 42, 19, or first I'm going to be 42, 7. I'm, I'm going way ahead of myself. And Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them, and but made himself unto them, and made himself strange to them, and spake rough to them. Here, here he sees his brother. Now, here's what's happened. The famine he dreamed would, would happen, happened. He predicted it, it happened. Now his brothers are coming, 10 of them, all the way uh, from Canaan, all the way to Egypt to get some corn, to get some food. It wasn't really corn, it was wheat, but it, they didn't have corn back then. That's an American crop. But they come and they, they're coming to get food, and he recognizes them. But I mean, he's in his Egyptian garment, maybe his head's shaven. He looks like an Egyptian. They don't recognize him, and he speaks roughly in Egyptian to them. And they don't know who this guy is, and he recognizes him. I think that's just totally fascinating. He recognized, verse 19. He says to them, if, if ye be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. And he, sa he, he, he says, bring your youngest brother unto me, he says. He hears them talk. He can understand what they're saying. Verse 21. And they said one to another, we are verily guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. They think and we're reaping what you sow. God's mad. This is God. They don't know it's Joseph. They're wondering, how could, how, how could this guy know all this? And it's fascinating what he does. 43.20, or 43.22, excuse me, it says here, In other money have you brought down in our hands to buy food. We cannot tell who put our money in our sacks. So they're leaving, and we know that he puts money, their money that gave, gave for grain back in their sacks. He also puts a silver cup in their sacks so that he can arrest one of them. I'm, I'm way ahead of myself, but you need to know the story. And so he can arrest them and say, you've stolen. Look at you stole this silver cup. This way he's going to bargain to get his brother Benjamin to come back. And that's when Judah says, you know, later he says, uh, the second time he fooled them, he said, keep me. They brought corn back, told their dad, but they had to come back because one of their brothers is in jail, and they come back, and he, he's playing this game again. He's working to get Benjamin back and eventually his father back into his life. Oh, how clever he is. In 44, says uh, verse, verse 44, uh, 12. And he searched and began at the eldest and left the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. So now... Now, now he's got the cup in Benjamin's sack. They brought Benjamin back, and this is just going to really scare him. Now he's got their attention, obviously. Verse 33, we know I already read. This is where Judas says, just take me. Don't, don't take him. And then verse 45, then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried. And the Bible says, he says, send everyone out of the room. And Joseph made himself known to his brethren, and he wept aloud. And the Egyptians uh, and the house of Pharaoh heard. So he says, everyone go out. And then he says to his brethren, I'm Joseph, your brother, in their language perfectly. And he begins to weep. You know, our, the soul is our seat of emotions. You can imagine what's going on in this room. Some are thinking, we're dead. The text bears that out. 
They're just totally blown away. What, is, what are you doing here? This is Egypt, and you're a powerful man. The thoughts that are going through their minds. But the true character of Joseph, I love this. Look at verse 5, chapter 45, verse 5. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. He said God had a plan. God had a plan. You know, no matter what we do, God has a plan. <laughs> I love that about God. I mess up, God has a plan. These guys messed up, God has a plan. Laban lied to deceive, and Jacob lied to deceive, and Laban out deceived him, and God had a plan for Leah, didn't he? God's always in control. He has a plan. You say, I've messed things up. God still can take that and work everything together for good. Doesn't say everything is good. Not when you've got sinful man involved. We, we mess up all the time. Verse 8. I love this. The ups and downs in Joseph's life, and in the end, he can say this. So now it was not you that sent me here, hither, it says, here, but God. God put me here in this kingdom. He knew they were thinking about the pit. I imagine in time he told them about the, the, the experience with Potiphar's wife and how he ended up in prison and how God worked all this out for good. Let me ask you, can you trust in your life that what you're going through now is going to work out for God's glory and God's good? I'm not saying that everything in your life is going to be good for you. Some of you say, there's things in my life that have not been good for me, Pastor. I don't know if they ever will. But remember, it'll all be for God's glory one day, and it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Amen. The trials that you suffer will be worth it all one day. And the experiences you've gone through, God has a plan. The plan may for, be for him to do something in someone else's life. I remember as a kid, man, we had it good. My dad had a good job. He's a, running a printing company in Grand Haven. We lived on the beach. We had a boat. We had a camper. My dad had a nice new Oldsmobile. We had a big home in Grand Haven. I mean, it was the place to live. We had it all. And then, you know, not picking on unions, but a union came in and, and shut the plant down. My dad lost his job. They closed the plant, and there we are. God moved us to Lansing. <sighs> Flat, no lake, auto industry. I mean, I didn't like Lansing. I didn't like moving. None of us liked moving, my mom especially. We never knew till later in life when Dad said, your mother was not happy moving to Grand Haven, from Grand Haven the, near the lake and everything there to Lansing. Our house wasn't as nice. The neighbors weren't as nice. The dogs weren't even as nice. <laughs> but God had a plan. All seven of us kids were baptized, First Baptist Church in Okemos. See, we were reared Christian Reformed, nothing wrong with them. But when we moved to Lansing, we didn't have a Christian Reformed church we liked, and this guy from the Baptist church kept inviting us to church. At Thanksgiving time, my dad was still unemployed. Two years. They gave us a whole bunch of food at Thanksgiving time. I've never had a Thanksgiving like that. All oh, those nuts in that big bag, and I could crack them open. This generation doesn't know how to crack open nuts. And, you know, it's true. I mean, we just, things have changed and all the pies and things we could have and all the stuff to make pies. My mom was a great cook. And that Thanksgiving dinner was special to us because there were nine poor people in that house. My dad wasn't working, but God was in control. And it wasn't Pipple Patterson that sent us to Lansing. It was God. And it wasn't for bad, it was for good. Because shortly after being saved, we moved to a church with a pastor that was a great, great speaker, and I sat under him, and as God was calling me to preach as a young guy, I put it in the back of my mind, but I thought, I'd like to be like him someday. Oh, if I could preach like him someday. And I thought, wait a minute, I'm not going to be a preacher. 
I'll be a professional athlete, but boy, I'd like to be like him someday. I couldn't be a professional athlete at 67 now. What else could I do? What God called me to do. And when my siblings all met their spouses in that area, you know, and are happily married, you say, isn't that something? How God had a plan. Did we ever make as much money? My dad never made the money he made in Grand Haven. But my dad's in heaven now, and I don't think he cares. He's with his Lord. And I know he's saying it's worth it all. My mother used to say, now Bob, that's my dad's name. My dad's two brothers were millionaires. One had a pool business, one was an insurance guy. He had a brother-in-law that was a millionaire and two other brother-in-laws that did very well. My dad would always say, oh, brother, look at them. They're all doing well. And my mom would say, now look, you're blessed with seven wonderful children. He'd... <laughs> he never thought about abandoning me, but he thought about killing me many times. God had a plan. And I love that about God. It's not easy sometimes in this world, but we can trust him. Amen. He's in control. Amen. If you're here today and you don't know him, he has you here for a purpose. It may be for you to come this morning and be saved. But I know God always has a plan. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. You're always good. You're always timely. I know I prayed so hard that this message would speak to someone, and I know it has because your word never returns void, but I don't know any of the hearts here, but I know you're still God. And you never change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You still speak to men. It was by the prophets and the apostles. And now today, it's by simple preaching of the word of God. As we read our Bibles, you speak. Even when we quote scripture, you speak. Lord, we know you're a great God, and I'm thankful you still speak to men. Bless us now in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing.